Insomniac Spider-Man isn't comic book accurate at all. Now whether you want to view that as a good or bad thing is up to you, but it's pretty much a fact that it's objectively not like its source material at all, mostly when looking at the second game. I just find the double standard of all to be quite funny under the context that I've seen various other pieces of superhero media be lambasted for straying from its source material, even though they only strayed from its source material by a much smaller degree, such as a large number of DC movies like Zack Snyder's BVS and his other films, X-Men 3 with minor changes to the Phoenix Force, and most importantly, other Spider-Man stories like the Raimi Spider-Man movies with dumb regurgitated takes like, oh um, organic web shooters, even though that's such a minor detail that Sam Raimi gave a reasonable explanation for. Or yet, another example with people complaining about Venom's appearance and claiming he's not big enough, even though he's still bigger than Spider-Man, which should be the only thing that matters, but anyway, before I get carried away on this tangent, let's get into Insomniac's further strafes, starting with their first game that didn't stray as far as the second game. Others have already said this before, but what can I say, dumb and still argue it. Do you guys know who, uh, Mary Jane is? She's supposed to be pretty, unlike, but she also has a job that takes advantage of her beauty, such as modeling, acting, or singing. Well, Insomniac decided that she gets to take Peter Parker's daily bugle job instead. Now, I know these cucks who often just pretend they read comics will scrounge for an excuse and say, Oh, she was a journalist by listing off another continuity such as Mary Jane from the Ultimate Comics who was studying for it, but that's it. And as said in my review, that shit doesn't really hold up as an excuse when most of the characters in that game are clearly not based off of the Ultimate Comics, such as Peter not being a child along with Peter and Black Cat not having a huge age gap, etc. I don't think that using this comic book accuracy excuse holds up when you start claiming they took from another continuity but only chose to do it with one character. On its own merits, it's also kind of dumb since they strayed from the source material only to rip off Lois Lane and add nothing of original substance to it except for a toxic, bitchy personality where she bitches about being saved as she sneaks into criminal hideouts and military bases. MCU She-Hulk is peak Martin Scorsese cinema in comparison to this shit. Fight me. But yeah, apart from Lois Jane, oops, uh, I mean, uh, apart from Mary Jane, I will admit that comic book accuracy wasn't drastically far off with most of the characters in the first Insomniac Spider-Man game. Aside from minor differences like the origins of Miles, Rhino's new tech direction which I don't dig too much, or more goofy decisions like Hammerhead becoming a cyborg. Although there's some other dumb moments that are also unlike the source material, such as Spider-Man getting his ass kicked by Silver Sable twice, even though Sable is just a human being with pistols, and has never beat Spider-Man one-on-one -on -one in any adaptation whether it be books as far as I know and a bunch of Spider-Man TV shows, Sable has also appeared in. Black Cat is also more toxic and dislikable than her usual appearance. Check out my review of the first game if you want more plot details about them. But anyway, with the first game out of the way, let's get on to Miles Morales where things may be a little more drastically different but not really. Unlike Lois Jane, I don't mind this drastic 180. Tinkerer, who's some old man Spider-Man villain who's really good at inventing things and various deadly gadgets. To be honest, I don't think much of him apart from remembering his fairly important role in Spider-Man Web of Shadows and Ultimate Alliance 2. But yeah, in Spider-Man Miles Morales' game, they made her a young, bustin' black girl, genius, with personal ties to Miles Morales, as they were childhood friends. Now this is admittedly a strafe, but I don't think the 180 is as bad or as drastically different as Lois Jane or Venom and Craven, who I'll get to later. But yeah, unlike Lois Jane, these changes made with Tinker didn't turn her into a ripoff of another character as far as I know. And these changes had narrative purposes 
as they gave Miles Morales a personal villain of his own. Tinkerer's changes may be objective in terms of appearance, but at the end of the day, she's still a smart person who makes violent gadgets that ends up being a Spider-Man villain. Just with a tad bit of sympathy added. Not as drastic of a difference as a bunch of MCU movie differences, or Insomniac Spider-Man 2, which we're about to jump into. Now, Insomniac Spider-Man 2 really has me agitated over these comic book accuracy double standards, more than the other examples like the MCU. Let me clarify that I'm not one of those nerd emojis who complain about comic book accuracy, as I don't really see Tinker as a big deal. But, I'm going to raise an eyebrow at dumb hypocrites who bitched at Spider-Man 3 for its comic book accuracy in regards to Venom, but then praise the even less accurate Spider-Man 2's progressive politics riddled story. And just to shut up the bitch ass cucks who pretend to read comics, here's me holding the two most important omnibuses when it comes to the source material behind Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man Birth of Venom, which contains all origin content of the symbiote, whether it be Peter's relationship with the symbiote or Eddie Brock's. I've owned this book for over 10 years, and then we have the most critically acclaimed Kraven story, if not most critically acclaimed Spider-Man story, Kraven's Last Hunt. Let's start out with Kraven. I'm sort of willing to let his gang of mercenaries slide for the sake of gameplay, of course, despite him never having or needing that in the past. Isn't the whole point of the hunt to, you know, hunt them down yourself like the prey he sees them as? But anyway. Beyond that, Nick, there's more differences that are mostly in the way the sky now physically operates. People may be calling it Giga, but Craven is too cracked to the point where it sort of destroys the concept of his character. Craven is now powerful enough to overpower certain strong as hell characters via brute force. He overpowers Scorpion with ease, even though Scorpion has definitely been betrayed as someone who's nearly as strong or even as fast as Spider Man. At the very least, he wouldn't be far off based upon what I've seen in general adaptations, most importantly, the comics. I double-checked what I already thought, and yeah, Scorpion definitely scales to being around the level of Spider-Man, so there's no way Kraven is beating him up via brute force in less than a minute, especially under the context of the fact that Scorpion is a villain who wouldn't hold back like Spider-Man does. And speaking of Spider-Man, he folds Spidey too! Just as fast as he folds Scorpion. Before we get into how wrong this all is, let's get into what Craven usually is. Craven is a human being who's borderline an enhanced human being via the herbs and potions he takes. Now, of course, these herbs and potions make him stronger and faster, but it never really takes him to the point where he's matching and nearly killing Spider-Man in under a minute. I know some copers will try to make the excuse of Spider-Man pulling his punches, but that doesn't justify a strong and fast character like Spider-Man losing in under a minute to Kraven when he should have already been ready for Kraven's apparent Spider-Tier strength when he discovered that he overpowered Scorpion with ease. What's so giga about Kraven is that he's a human pushing his limits and enhancing himself as much as he can in tandem with using various tricks, tools, and gadgets to try to get the edge over Spider-Man and achieve the unobtainable goal of beating him despite his human limitations. I know he's stronger than regular humans, but still, it ain't Spider-Man tier, a little above Captain America tier, at best. Point is, Kraven never really beats Spider-Man. In Kraven's last hunt, it's made quite clear through text in the book itself that he got lucky and only beat Spider-Man via flukes like Spider-Man just so happening to be tired around the time Kraven made a surprise attack. After knocking out Spider-Man, he buries Spider-Man and takes his mantle to prove himself superior. There's this evil monster called Vermin, who was so tough that Spider-Man and Captain America had to team up to fight him. Kraven with the Spider-Man mantle sets out to beat this creature that Spider-Man couldn't beat by himself, all as an attempt to prove himself superior. Little does he know that he would only beat Vermin because Vermin was in a hungered state. Spider-Man later climbs out of the grave in a daisy state and sets out to get back at Kraven, despite the state he's in. Kraven doesn't entertain fighting him again as he already believes he's proven himself and instead reveals Vermin who he's captured and sets loose against Spider-Man. 
Spider-Man is about to lose to Vermin, probably due to Peter's tired state, and then Kraven stops Vermin from killing Spider-Man, as Kraven believes his point has been made. But as I delved into, the one time Kraven did win was pretty muddled and lucky for best words. Oh, and just to clarify, Spider-Man's black suit in Kraven's Last Hunt isn't the symbiote, it's just a regular suit with the same design. But anyway, the whole questionable scaling of him now being able to curb stomp Spider-Man is something Insomniac just did as a cheap way to hype up this villain. I don't mind him putting up a fight or even killing the other Spider-Man villains, but it wouldn't go that easy with Scorpion. And he shouldn't even be beating Spider-Man, even without the black suit. In under a minute, especially without any additional traps or anything. Like... What chance did this guy in Kraven's intro even have? Kraven didn't even need to sneak up on him! Like, even Spectacular Spider-Man at least was smart enough to go all out and just give him powers, as he tried things the regular way first before doing so. But anyway, on its own merits I could see some cool aspects of Insomniac's Kraven despite these blemishes, such as him being an honor-bound man who wants to go out with honor, and not just die of old age similar to his books a tad bit, but I honestly find that it falls flat with strength being way too beyond human, such as him fighting a guy who stops trains. I'll reiterate that within this game, Spider-Man never beats Kraven. Not even Miles does. Kraven only loses to the symbiote, whether it be Peter wearing it or Harry when he becomes Venom. Don't even get me started on Peter Parker getting folded in nearly every 1v1 fight. He literally doesn't have a single 1v1 win in the game when not working with Miles or the symbiote. This is a fact. Arguing with me is nothing but a good speedrunning tactic to making a fool of yourself. But yeah, I wouldn't put Insomniac Craven near his high tier storytelling of Craven's Last Hunt. A story about an honor-bound man trapped in a world of first-world comfort devolving most people around him, whether it be physically or by moral principles. A man who's only a human taking on an unreachable goal and then losing all purpose when that goal is met by the stroke of luck. Phew, what a deep doozy. Next we have Venom, who's probably the least accurate example I've ever seen in fiction just about you pretty much have to call him a different character. Although I don't find him to be bad on his own merits either, but he is objectively the least accurate. I may have all the knowledge in this book of mine, but this is so inaccurate that I don't even need this book. He's not Eddie Brock, which basically ends a debate. Harry has never been Venom in any of the comics, it's only happened in like some mid Spidey MCU humor TV show. But beyond the differences in origin, he doesn't behave like Venom either, as he now immediately becomes a world endangering threat instead of just being a Spider-Man villain with a bit of dark humor to him. This Venom doesn't have any humor to him at all, let alone being a bit of an anti-hero that certain people want him to be. He's basically now a Doomsday-esque villain. Like, people gave Tom Hardy's Venom crap for straying from the source material, which it undeniably did to a higher degree than the petty crap they gave Sam Raimi's Venom, but even Tom Hardy's Venom's differences from its source material isn't as drastic as Insomniac's Venom Doomsday. Don't even get me started on Sam Raimi's, which got a bunch of flack with reasons that were nitpicky and petty as hell. While Insomniac's version gets far less blowback, is it because he's bigger? Is that all that matters? Well, I'll play your little size game and state that Insomniac's Venom is way bigger than comic book Venom than Raimi's Venom was smaller. The size difference is objectively bigger with Insomniac. Comic Venom is 6'3 and Topher Grace was 5'9 and Insomniac Venom is 10'5. So yeah, you cuckballs still lose and end up being hypocrites within the confines of your own shitty pick and choose nitpick logic. Oh, and speaking of Venom in games, I'll name off yet another hypocritical scenario involving Venom in Spider-Man Web of Shadows. I remember when some shitty overrated whiny YouTuber who over exaggerates problems brought up a so-called con of the symbiote not being able to make multiple spawns in Web of Shadows. 
And then I saw a bunch of shitty nerds hive and copy and paste that shit as if it was a significant con or stray from the source material. Sure, it's true, but, you know, for the sake of their amazing concept of the story, it's just something they added. I can treat it like some symbiote mutation, as Spider-Man himself states that something about the symbiote is different now. But you know, these people will regurgitate something nitpicky like that, and then let Insomniac slide, but whatever. This shitty nitpick aside, Spider-Man Web of Shadows was very in line with the main 616 source material, such as the cool mission where Wolverine references a bunch of actual comic issues, some of which were actually in this omnibus of mine, along with other stories like when he first wore the black suit, etc. Comic book accuracy is just one of the many one-ups that Web of Shadows has over Insomniac in combination with it being a PS3 game that has faster swing speed than a PS5 game, and is also just a better game with combat on multiple levels, but anyway, that just about covers Venom. I wish I was done, but there's more. Mary Jane is still in the second game, and now she's uglier than ever. Ugliest normal human under 30 I've ever seen, just about, to be honest. But anyway, on top of her being Lois Jane and having a bunch of bitchy personality traits, she is now a capable combatant that can take out Craven's hunters, along with taking out a large number of symbiotes, including this one that's as big as Hulk. God, this game's writing is a fucking mess. I'm not joking when I say I put She-Hulk above this shit. But anyway, blah blah blah, Mary Jane was never someone who was capable of pulling a Lara Croft Tomb Raider, despite their shitty attempt to provide a reason, when they said she trained the Silver Sable, even though that training didn't last anything more than half a month or so. Mary Ray Skywalker Jane. <laughs> Web of Shadows had a Mary Jane segment where she was wielding a gun too, but she wasn't 1v dozening people, she was helping Spider-Man. Gameplay aside, we could canonically assume that Spider-Man was just guarding her overtime as she got shots off. Big difference from Insomniacs, which really can't be argued at all. But anyway, beyond all of that shite, Mary Jane becomes infected and becomes Scream, who is a different character entirely. Unlike various others, I'm not going to pretend I've read every comic on all of these characters, but I do know that Scream isn't Mary Jane. She's Donna Diego, a person who volunteered herself for some government agency called the Life Foundation that wanted to make a team of symbiotes. But yeah, at this point, they might as well have just gave Mary Jane her own unique design, similar to what an actual good symbiote Spider-Man game did with its characters such as Black Cat. But anyway, Lois Jane, Ray Skywalker, Scream beat Spidey at the end of the boss fight after bitching at him. Scream never beat Spider-Man 1v1 in any story that I know of, so there's that. This game really wants to fold Peter Parker and give him a slower reaction time than MJ, on top of taking the guy who stops trains and then trapping him under a fridge. This is more of a minor and less offensive change, but Harry is also briefly Agent Venom on top of being Venom. Agent Venom being someone who was supposed to be Flash Thompson, in a story that takes him from bullying a superhero to being like one. I like the concept. I didn't really hate Harry being a bit like this, but it's yet again nothing like the source material. This is a change I loved for the sake of gameplay purposes, but Mr. Negative turns Peter Parker into anti-Venom after getting rid of the original symbiote. It's a symbiote which doesn't affect the mind of its host, with Anti-Venom's most mainstream appearance being Spider-Man Edge of Time. Although this was something that Eddie Brock was turned into by Mr. Negative instead, when it comes to the source material. The suit can cure people of various things like the symbiotes and actual diseases, although it only seems to work on symbiotes in this game. Although I find it very odd that Anti-Venom Spider-Man still ends up being curb stomped by Venom anyway. They really want to fold Peter, once again. I don't really know why Insomniac felt the need to mix up all the symbiote identities for no reason, such as deleting Eddie Brock, especially Scream which just felt random. The bare bones logic I'm guessing is that Scream is someone who uses red hair in her combat occasionally, and Mary Jane is someone who's known for her red hair, 
so they just randomly put two and two together, I guess. Cletus Cassidy is in the game as a side mission, which means he'll probably be Carnage, like the source material. But Cletus is portrayed as some crazy cult leader in this game, instead of a solo crazy serial killer. But I guess it's not as drastic of a difference as the other symbiote characters, but it's also kinda odd how he gets to stay his proper symbiote role when everyone else gets shuffled around or deleted like Eddie Brock, as confirmed by the game's director, stating that Brock doesn't exist in this universe. Which is pretty odd given that he was the second person shown wearing it. I was also open to the symbiote leaving Harry and going to Brock later at the very least, but nope, he's just deleted I guess. But yeah, let's wrap things up with something that I guess is sort of debatable, but I think it's just a petty excuse that's hanging on the puny threads of books that weren't that good, and books that I could barely track down, that I'm pretty sure most people didn't read, including the writers of this game itself. Insomniacs Bisexual Black Cat, who others have tried to justify by googling it and saying, Oh look guys, uh, she's been bisexual since the 90s. Well, I actually made the effort to dig for that detail, unlike these high thinking, copying and pasting off of Google drones. I went to my illegal online comic site and found both of the stories that went far back. One was only part of an alternate universe with Spider-Girl, which was never canon, and then there's admittedly a canon example in what's legitimately called the evil that men do. But despite the book having some decent art, it's sort of average at best work that doesn't even stick out because it's written by... You. It's written by fucking cryboy Kevin Smith of all people. Like, are you guys really going to cite a Kevin Smith book of all things, a sellout who has a crying montage over various forms of fiction, like him crying over The Last Jedi before this cuck did. Like if it was written by anyone other than Kevin Smith, you cucks might have had a leg to stand on, but no. I would have taken Dan Slot more seriously than this. Black Cat pulls an insomniac silver sable and takes Spider-Man out with his own web shooters like what the hell is this what a joke and a waste of my time researching for shit that you guys didn't even read or research yourself despite being in opposition or defending the shit and using it as an excuse some part of me doesn't really give too much of a crap about this game's adaptation of black cat being bi but as said in my last video it really came off as an excuse to do some insane virtue signaling given that her screen time and story was quite minimal, with her arc being that she won't use the Doctor Strange teleporting device to steal stuff, but she'll use it to see her girlfriend in Paris. But yeah, these writers probably didn't read the books themselves either and just did it to do it to look progressive. They probably would have done this even if the book didn't exist, especially given their track record of straying from the source material with everything I've said so far. On top of that game's overabundance of progressive propaganda shit that doesn't belong in a game that a bunch of 8 year olds will play as said in my last video. But yeah, from what I've read of in my books such as Birth of Venom or other shows or games, Black Hat has never really given me bisexual lesbian vibes, given that one of her main shticks is, you know, hitting on and seducing Spider-Man. Oh, and don't mention shitty modern Black Cat comics. I don't care about progressive shit show modern comics where Wolverine and Iceman are both into boys and Spider-Man gets cucked, etc. But anyway, that's everything just about. Maybe I missed some other things, but I tried to only name off differences that were a significant difference. But yeah, it's objectively a fact that Insomniac Spider-Man 2 is the least comic accurate Spider-Man game or least comic accurate superhero game I have ever seen on top of being the most woke one. Now for the final time I'll clarify, I'm not one of those people who views comic book accuracy as a measuring factor for quality, although I can see some problems with things being a drastic change for the worse. And a lot of these changes in Spider-Man 2 are sort of for the worse. And I don't believe this game topped many better examples of these characters such as Spider-Man 3, 
Craven's Last Hunt, Spider-Man 2's video games Black Cat, and Spider-Man Web of Shadows. I also ask that you guys have some more consistency given what I mentioned near the start of this video, where a bunch of you bozos will go around bashing DC movies and Raimi Spider-Man movies, etc. for its lack of comic book accuracy, and then let shit like Lois Jane and Doomsday Venom slide because you guys just use hypocritical excuses for criticism, like comic book accuracy, instead of actual reasons. I swear most of the people bitching about comic book accuracy these days are people that don't actually read them. They just exclusively watch YouTube videos and shorts about it instead, such as the bisexual black cat scenario I delved into. I'd... i just like you guys to be more logical and better to be honest. But a lot of these cucks who do this shit will always pretend they don't, but whatever. Check out my media, such as my Discord where you can see what I'm up to, and talk with minds that make sense. Check out my other Spider-Man videos along with socials in my link tree like my Patreon and Instagram. But yeah, thanks for watching.